Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Lando. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about doxepin or Sinequan. This is an antidepressant that was first approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1969. So that means it's more than half a century old, but there are still more than 2 million prescriptions written for the drug every year. It's not a controlled substance. Actually, it was the first member of the tricyclic antidepressant family. So in that family, we have amitriptyline, Elevil, nortriptyline, variety of other medicines. And it also is the only H1 antihistamine that's specifically approved by the Food and Drug Administration for treatment of insomnia. Indications for the drug, according to the FDA, are anxiety and depression, of course, and insomnia. And topically, it can be used for treatment of itching, but it's often used off-label. It's used as an adjunct for people who have cancer-related pain. It's used as a prophylaxis against migraine headaches. So not for treatment of migraine headaches, but to prevent their onset. Used for people who have symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Used for people with symptoms of temporomandibular joint disorder. Because it's antihistamine, it is a second-line therapy for people who have chronic urticaria. It's so old that they still refer to the drug as a treatment for psychoneurotic patients. People who have anxiety and depression. But it's not used for people who have bipolar disorder. So even if you have depression, if the depression is related to bipolar disorder, this drug isn't for you. What kind of symptoms might you have? Well, guilt and worry and tension and fear and somatic symptoms. You think your abdomen isn't working right or your chest isn't working right or you have muscle aches or pains and you've been evaluated and it doesn't seem that there's any medical reason. Well, then this drug might be appropriate or people who have a lack of energy or people who have sleep disturbance related to those psychiatric abnormalities. Fortunately, the drug comes in a variety of different strengths comes in a capsule, either 10 milligram, 25 milligram, 50 milligram, 75 milligram, 100 milligram, 150 milligram. Also comes as a suspension, 10 milligrams in one milliliter, and since there are five milliliters in a teaspoon, that means the strength is 50 milligrams in a teaspoon. Comes in a bottle of 120 milliliters, so you take the appropriate amount, you dilute it in three or four ounces of water, orange juice, or milk, or grapefruit juice, and then take it. Also comes as a cream, 5% cream, can be used topically for itching. It's being evaluated for use of multiple different forms. People who take the drug for depression should be given a little two-page guide that warns them about some of the side effects, especially the suicide related to the drug, because all antidepressants come with a warning label. The dose, if you happen to have moderate, even mild depression, optimal dose, 75 milligrams to 150 milligrams, but you always start at 75 milligrams or less. So you can gradually increase or decrease the amount, but you don't start at 150 milligrams. People who have more severe depression, more severe illness, they can go up to 300 milligrams, but it doesn't seem that the drug is more effective if you take a dose of greater than 300 milligrams, although some people do quite well if they take no more than 25 or 50 milligrams. You take the dose in the evening, at nighttime, you take it all at once if you're taking up to 150 milligrams. If you're taking a higher dose, you should divide it into two doses, one in the morning, one in the evening, if you're taking it as a sedative hypnotic, as a sleeping pill. Then the dose is much less than it is if you were taking it as an antidepressant. So you would take only 3 milligrams up to 25 milligrams. Less than 25 milligrams, it's a pure antihistamine. Now, just like with any other kind of a drug, it might lose its effect if you keep taking it as a sleeping pill over a period of time. But it's probably one of the drugs that you could consider if you needed a sleeping pill. There's a black box warning on the medicine for the antidepressant activity. 
Well, for children and adolescents and young adults less than 24 years of age, it seems that taking any antidepressant, not specifically doxepin, but any of the antidepressants associated with an increase in thoughts of suicide and contemplation of suicide, actually committing suicide, studies done were relatively short term, but they did show that people who were older, people who were over age 65, actually the likelihood of suicide was reduced rather than increased. So it's not approved for pediatric use. People should be monitored carefully starting the dose or changing the amount of the dose. Should realize that there are certain kinds of symptoms that might indicate you're at higher risk of contemplating suicide. So if you take the drug and then all of a sudden you develop some anxiety or agitation or panic or insomnia or irritability or hostility, if you have some impulsivity or restlessness or mania or hypomania, then you need to be evaluated very quickly and you shouldn't take the drug if you happen to have bipolar disorder. Now, depression might be the first sign of bipolar disorder. So how can you tell whether it's just depression, major depressive disorder, or if it's depression associated with bipolar disorder? Well, you screen the individual to see if there's a history of mania or hypomania, history in the family of suicide, what kind of psychiatric conditions have been in the family. And certainly, if a person takes the drug and the symptoms seem to worsen or you develop new symptoms, then you need to be reevaluated quite quickly. If you happen to have hypersensitivity to the medicine, obviously you shouldn't take it. And people who have narrow angle glaucoma shouldn't take the drug. Got to be extraordinarily cautious in those individuals who have urinary hesitancy, urinary retention, oftentimes an elderly individual, male, who has an enlarged prostate, and sometime, since the medicine can interfere with the conducting system of the heart, people who have conduction abnormalities, like a bundle branch block or AV block, where the impulse can't go from the top part of the heart to the bottom part of the heart, and control, control contractions, well, those individuals, probably not good choice for the drug. Mechanism of action of the drug, well, we don't really know. It's not a central nervous system stimulant, not an MAO inhibitor, but it seems like it works on serotonin metabolism and the cholinergic metabolism and the histamine metabolism. If we take it at a dose of less than 25 milligrams, certainly seems to just work on the histamine receptors. Actually, it's a better antihistamine than either Benadryl or doxylamine. It's considered a dirty drug, dirty drug because it works on so many different sites in the brain. It seems that it doesn't work on the dopamine receptor. It doesn't seem to lead to euphoria. You don't develop any tolerance or dependence on the drug, but it might act on the sodium and the potassium channels. That's why you get in trouble with uh, heart-related disorders, because those are channels that you find in the cardiac cells, in the myocardial cells. And because of that, there's some issue if you happen to have a conduction disorder. Pregnancy, well, certainly doesn't seem to cause any harm in animals. Hasn't really been studied in humans, but in one woman who was taking the medicine and breastfeeding, the infant was reported to suffer from apnea and some drowsiness, so probably not appropriate for breastfeeding women, not approved for pediatric use under age 12. And for older individuals, geriatric population over age 65, need to be very cautious about the dose, so tend to start with a relatively low dose because it has a sedating activity, and the sedation might lead to increased confusion and over-sedation. People maybe drive a car and have problems. So if you happen to have renal impairment, it's not an issue with this drug. If you have liver impairment, it's going to decrease the metabolism and increase the blood levels, so you something wrong with the liver, you have to be extra cautious about taking the drug, perhaps consider a decreased dose. You monitor the blood levels at times. Well, it's not typically done, but therapeutically we know that the level 
between 150 and 250 nanograms per milliliter. That's the antidepressant dose. So people given the drug as an antidepressant, unfortunately, only about 10% fell in that level, and about 90% weren't getting enough. So they were at a sub-therapeutic level. So sometime when you take the drug and it doesn't seem to work, it's because you're not getting enough of the drug. Like all of the tricyclic antidepressants, it's metabolized in the liver by an enzyme known as 2D6. Well, there are a variety of other substances that can interfere with the 2D6, like the opioids and the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and psychedelics and certain herbal medicines, alcohol. So you have to be careful if you're taking this drug and another drug that's going to interact with the serotonin metabolism because that might lead to what we call the serotonin syndrome, which can change your mental state, can lead to nervousness and excitation and agitation, lead to confusion and increased heart rate, increased body temperature and flushing and tremor and rigidity. So you do be careful what kind of medicines you're taking. We know that somewhere between 7 and 10 percent of Caucasians are poor metabolizers of the 2D6. So we don't have any information on the Asian population or the African American population, but that means that you could have up to an eight-fold increase in the concentration of the doxepin, even if you're not taking other, any other medicine that might interact with it because you just don't have the capability to metabolize the drug. And also, have to be careful, if you have been taking Prozac, fluoxetine, you have to wait five weeks after you stop that before you start the doxepin. Now, if you're taking a drug that inhibits that enzyme, the 2D6, you might need to take a lower dose of the doxepin to start with, and then if you ever stop that other medicine, then you might need to increase the doxepin level. So you should keep your doctor informed on the kinds of medicines you're starting and stopping. Now the 2D6, that's a very important drug metabolizing enzyme. It's important for the phenothiazines, those antipsychotics like Seroquel and Zyprexa and the SSRIs like Prozac and Paxil. It's important for the opioids and the beta blockers and for certain medicines that control the heart rate, heart rhythm, like Tambacore and Rhythmol. If you're taking an MAO inhibitor, that could lead to serious complications, even death, if you happen to take doxepin. So you shouldn't take doxepin and an MAO inhibitor within two weeks of each other should be very careful about combining it with alcohol, can lead to an unintentional overdose. If you're taking Tagamet, Tagamet increases the concentration of doxepin. Tagamet also is known as cimetidine. So it increases the concentration, so it could lead to a dry mouth or urinary retention or blurred vision. And if you stop taking the Tagamet, then you have to readjust the dose of the doxepin. You can take it with food. But if you do take it with food, it's going to decrease the absorption by about three hours after you take a fatty meal. But the systemic clearance is going to be reduced. So overall, you're going to end up about the same. It seems to be very well absorbed. So after you take it, unfortunately, somewhere between 50 and 90 percent is going to go right to the liver and be metabolized before it gets into your system. And once it gets into your system, 80% is going to be bound to protein. So it's going to be metabolized by that 2D6 enzyme. There's another one called 2C19. It's going to be metabolized to another compound called nordoxepin. That's active, and uh, there are a variety of other glucuronides that are inactive. They appear in the urine. The terminal half-life of the drug, the doxepin, is about 15 hours. The nordoxepin, remember that's still going to be active, that's going to be around for about 30 hours. The drug can cause drowsiness even the next day. That means that you might have some difficulty driving or operating dangerous equipment. You take the drug. It's sedating, so it can lead to confusion. It's over sedation in the elderly. And remember we said that there's a small increase in the incidence of 
thoughts of suicide or contemplation of suicide. So the smallest dose and the fewest number of pills is most appropriate. And if a person has some psychotic hallucinations or manic symptoms, then this is not the right drug. Side effects of the medicine, side effects, doxepin, uh, anticholinergic effects, so about 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent, going to suffer from dry mouth and maybe some blurred vision. Some people develop constipation or urinary retention or memory impairment. There's confusion and it might increase what's known as the QT interval. The QT interval on the electrocardiogram is the time between the Q wave and the T wave and that might predispose to significant arrhythmias especially if you're taking other drugs that interact with the QT interval or you have electrolyte abnormalities. So you need to make certain that you talk with the doctor about any kind of medicine that might interfere with the QT interval. Central nervous system, well, that seems to be the major side effect with drowsiness being the A number one. About 25% of the people are going to develop headache, and a smaller number of people, about 20%, going to suffer from either dizziness or confusion. Then some people will develop hallucinations or disorientation or numbness, paresthesias where you feel like pins and needles in the fingers and the toes, difficult time walking a straight line, we call it ataxia. Some people develop what we call extrapyramidal symptoms of rigidity or restlessness or slowed movement. Some people develop tardive dyskinesia or seizures or tremor or ringing in the ears. Some people are going to have some cardiovascular effects, either increase or decrease in the blood pressure. Sometimes an increase in the heart rate. Some people are going to develop a rash or some swelling of the extremities or maybe even develop extra sensitivity to the sun. And as always, we have gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Some people, the appetite is increased. Some people, the appetite is decreased. Some people complain of indigestion or a change in uh, taste. Can alter the libido. Can lead to swelling of the testicles or enlargement of the male breast. Increase in the fasting blood sugar. Decrease in the sodium. But all those are relatively minor. Now, it's about two to three times as toxic as another member of the tricyclic antidepressant family, amitriptyline. And the tricyclic antidepressants are generally thought of as having more side effects, greater toxicity, than the SSRIs or the SNRIs. But it certainly is a consideration if some of the other medicines don't work. And this one, like I say, is prescribed more than two million times a year and seems to be a solid drug withdrawal symptoms if you stop it abruptly, so you should gradually taper off of the medicine, but addiction isn't a problem. Now, if you overdose on the medicine, that could be a problem. Vomiting and drowsiness, and pupils dilate, blood pressure falls quite substantially, you develop those arrhythmias I talked about, you can have disturbances in your concentration, confusion, agitation, visual hallucination. Some people develop some seizures, convulsions, central nervous system depression, coma might occur. Treatment for overdose, well, monitor with the electrocardiogram for at least six hours. Sometime we inject some bicarbonate intravenously to bring the pH up a little bit so that the medicine can be cleared a little bit more quickly. Now, because the medicine might act as a treatment for sleeping disorders, for insomnia, well, they came out with a brand name for doxepin relatively recently in 2010, and it's called Silenor. And Silenor is approved specifically to treat insomnia, not to treat depression. It comes in two different strengths. Six milligrams for adults and three milligrams for the elderly. These are for people who have difficult time maintaining the sleep. It's not to help get you to sleep, but it's to keep you asleep once you're already asleep. So the onset is about 30 minutes after you take the drug. Doesn't carry a black box warning for suicide or any of those other kind of problems because remember it's now an antihistamine dose. It's not all of those other kind of activities that we talked about. 
if you take the medicine as a uh, treatment for insomnia and you've been taking it without any improvement for a week or two, then probably you should come off of the drug. It's thought that you should probably only take the drug for up to about 12 weeks anyway. And you don't take it within three hours of a meal because that's going to alter the metabolism of the drug. Remember we said it's going to change the way the drug acts in the body. The histamine activity seems to increase during the latter portion of the night. So that seems to be about the time when the doxepin is effective in the body. When you wake up in the morning, there's a boost in the histamine and it overwhelms the antihistaminic effect of the doxepin. So there's supposed to be less likelihood that you're going to have that carryover effect in the tiredness in the morning and the difficult time driving or doing some of those other kind of risky activities. But even if you take six milligrams, you might for some people who are ultra sensitive to the medicine might have some problems. Now, if you happen to have obstructive sleep apnea, Silenor or Doxepin, probably not a good therapy. Side effect of the Silenor, even if you're taking it a dose of just three or six milligrams, can cause some sedation and some somnolence, and up to about 10% of people, some nausea and a couple percent of people, even at the low dose. It's highly effective at the H1, the antihistamine receptor, so it doesn't have any effect on serotonin, doesn't have any effect on the adrenergic activity. So that's good. And the antidepressant dose is listed in the Beers list. The Beers list is a list of drugs that senior citizens probably should not take. So you probably should not take the doxepin at an antidepressant dose if you happen to be an older individual. However, it's not listed as a dose that you would take for sleep disorder, so the three milligram or six milligram. Well, how do we rate it as a sleeping pill? We talk about the wake after sleep onset. So once you fall asleep, how much time do you spend awake before you finally get out of bed in the morning? One study showed that adults spend about 60 minutes with what we call the wake after sleep onset. Well, taking the doxepin reduced to about 40 minutes, and elderly individuals spend about 60, I'm sorry, 120 minutes with wake after they went to bed before they finally got out of bed in the morning, decreased to about 80 minutes if they took the doxepin. So the total sleep time increased from about 6 hours 15 minutes to about 6 hours and 40 minutes. Now, as far as insomnia therapy is concerned, the Cochrane Collaboration, they sort of are a nonpartisan group that rates medicines. They say there's really no high quality evidence regarding doxepin as a sleeping pill, but it seems to be moderately effective. It seems to increase the sleep efficiency, increases the sleep time by somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes, doesn't change the sleep latency, as I mentioned, unless you take it at a high dose, antidepressant dose of 50 to 300 milligrams. Now, additionally, you could use the medicine topically. It's called Zonalin. Zonalin is 5% doxepin cream. It comes in 30 milligram, 45 milligram, 60 milligram tube. Now, each one gram, one gram is 1,000 milligrams, each gram of the cream contains about 44 milligrams of the doxepin itself. So it's used for short-term control of itch, of localized itch maybe from atopic dermatitis or eczema or neurodermatitis. It's used three or four times a day, but shouldn't be used for more than about eight days. And even if you use it topically, especially if you use it on a relatively large area of the skin, then you find that some of it can be absorbed and you can get close to the level where it might be antidepressant. So that means that you could have some of the side effects like the drowsiness, certainly if you put it on more than 10% of the body surface area. You could take the medicine orally for itch control, especially if you have uremia, your kidneys don't work well. Well, people on hemodialysis very frequently itch. This might be at a low dose, a therapy for that. Neuropathic pain, originally they thought it might be helpful, but we don't really have any good evidence from recent studies that suggest it is. Topically, if you have some mucositis, inflammation, irritation of the inside of your mouth, 
well at a dose of 25 milligrams and 5 milliliters of water compared to say Benadryl combined with lidocaine combined with an antacid mix seems that they both seem to do fairly well except the doxepin when you swish it around inside your mouth or apply it to the cheeks it has a strong burning and an unpleasant taste so most people don't like it how much does the medicine cost well you can get 30 capsules at 75 milligrams cash price is somewhere between about 40 and 50 dollars 150 milligrams 30 to 115 dollars well if you want to get the trade name you could get the trade name for somewhere in excess of that amount if you happen to want the doxepin at 10 milligrams you could get 30 of those pills for 20 to 30 dollars with a coupon 10 to 20 dollars the silenor on the other hand would cost cash somewhere between 200 and 460 dollars with a coupon, it would still cost between $160 and $300, so that's a lot of money. On the other hand, you could get some of the solution, the 120 milligrams that comes as the 10 milligram per 1 ml, or you could buy that, the cash price is $25 to $80, or with a coupon, $10 to $20, and you could take a fifth of a teaspoon of that medicine that would give you a sufficient amount to help you sleep. That would be a heck of a lot less expensive than the Silenor. That would be okay. If you're using the topical cream, the Zonalon, well, that's very expensive. If you get the 45 milligram tube, cash price is $650. With a coupon, it's still $280 to $420. But you could get some of the 100 milligram generic doxepin, get 20 of them for about $15 and have the pharmacy mash them up and dissolve them in a cream. That would give you the same thing for 20 bucks. So that's the story about doxepin. Sometimes it's used for depression, sometimes for anxiety, but it's often used at a low dose to treat insomnia. Typical dose for depression, 75 to 150 milligrams, even less in some people. But for people for sleep disorders, oftentimes 10 milligrams or even less seems to be relatively helpful in keeping you asleep, not getting you to sleep. And remember that if you buy the generic brand, much less expensive, and you can use that generic brand instead of the Silenor, that's the trade name get the same effect for much less money anyway thanks for watching if you enjoyed the show please tell a friend consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos i appreciate your interest i'm dr ken landau